Welcome to this Geologists in Action presentation on core splitting, know the assumptions underlying the best practice. I'm David Abbott, and a bit about me, I've got 45 years of worldwide experience in mining geology. The first 21 years of my career were spent as a geologist of the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, where I helped company, mining and oil and gas companies uh, comply with the securities laws and also investigated mining and oil and gas frauds. I've been a consulting mining geologist since 1996, working with gold, silver, platinum group metals, and base metals, and industrial minerals all over the world, and basically applying the resource and reserve classification systems to specific deposits and I've been giving talks and writing about geoscience professional ethics since 1989, including the professional ethics and practices columns in the AIPGs, the professional geologists. I received my bachelor's in earth science from Dartmouth College and a ge master's in geology from the Colorado School of Mines. Course splitting is a best practice common best practice for the collection of both the original and duplicate field samples as part of a quality assurance quality control testing and analysis program. But this common best practice inherently assumes that mineralization is statistically homogeneous throughout the core. Therefore, one should expect a high degree of correlation between samples and should have correlation cor efficiency of R squared so values of 0.9 or better if the collection, preparation, and analytical procedures are accurate. The problem of the practice occurs when this doesn't happen, when the seldom stated assumptions underlying the practice are not met, in this case, that the sample is statistically homogeneous. And what do we mean by statistical homogeneity? It's a must for sampling. And it's a scale issue, as pointed out by Turner and Weiss in their 1963 structural analysis of metamorphic tectonites. As we see in the top row of figures, uh, if you're looking at a pluton and small areas within a pluton, why? areas one and two are not the same in detail, but statistically they are the same. Whereas when they go to a much smaller scale, in this case a um, thin section scale, uh, as in the lower level, one, the two portions of that thin section are not the same because one type of mineral, uh, the micas, uh, kind of like bacon, are not present in both slides. So, core splitting procedure, the, you collect the duplicate samples by, in two steps. The first, the core is sawed in half, with one half being collected as the original field sample for analysis, and the other half is retained as part of the core library. A duplicate field sample is collected when the library core half is sawed in half again, uh, being a quarter of the whole, uh, and so one quarter is retained and the other core, quarter of the whole is submitted for a duplicate analysis. And here we have a picture of a uh, core box that has both been split in half and part has been quarter sawn to collect duplicate field analyses. The problem is that the correlations between the analyses of the original and duplicate, that is the quarter samples of the core in the previous slide, are terrible because of the lack of statistical homogeneity. You know, they're platinum and palladium is around half, but that's still not all that good. Gold is terrible. Now here's an outcrop of this deposit. It's a copper nickel platinum group metal deposit in Canada. You can tell that because of the Canadian hammer the geologist is holding. These are shield rocks, they're hard. 
and the hammers in the top of a saw cut channel sample, uh, which is essentially equivalent to a core sample. And I ask you if you were to take a similar channel or core sample and move it a foot or two to the left or right of that existing channel, would you get the same analyses? You would not because the mineralization is not statistically present throughout. Uh, you can even see some of the crystal sizes under her feet. Core splitting depends on the uniformity of the mineral sizes and distribution throughout the core. And here we have a picture of two pieces of pretium resources core. Uh, it's uh, through the Bruce Jack deposit. And the mineral there actually is electrum. It's around 60% gold, 40% silver. Uh, but nice shiny stuff. And if we were saw this core in half, it's quite clear that each half would provide a different assay. And that says, okay, we can't split core and get reasonable results. So clearly the standard practice of splitting core doesn't work for these deposits because the basic assumption that the mineralization is uniformly distributed throughout the core or channel samples and outcrops or mine faces, whatever, is not met. Using larger diameter core or even twinning large diameter core would solve the problem. Statistical homogeneity may not be achieved in these deposits at scales of less than hundreds or thousands of feet. What you need to do is for your QAQC and for your resource estimation. First of all, in these deposits, you get really nice core recovery. So that's indicating that your valid field sampling method is good, good core recovery. Second, you can reanalyze the pulps returned from the lab along with the use of standard and blank samples that you put in. And this demonstrates that a lack of correlation is not due to sample preparation or the analytical processes, because the pulp should correlate very nicely. Uh, and you can also use these to check um, with other labs. Um, in deposits like these, the only use of thousands of sample analyses taken from hundreds of drill holes throughout the deposit, combined with careful geological modeling of the deposit, allows a reasonable estimation of overall metal grades and the estimation of mineral resources and perhaps ore reserves. It takes a lot of data and careful analysis of the geology before you can estimate reserves with these sorts of deposits. So in conclusion, whether the so-called best practice is really applicable to the job at hand must be decided on the basis of professional judgment of what you're doing. When you decide to deviate from a published best practice for sound scientific reasons, you should describe in detail in your report what the so-called best practice is and why it was inappropriate for what you were doing and why the method you used was better. And if you become aware that a best practice is being proposed, actively urge that those proposing the best practice include a description of the proposed best practice, what the underlying assumptions are that must be met in order for the best practice to be valid. Thank you for your attention.